never be seen before seen on earth. But the reader is also disturbed, for surely, he says, this is the church as it was meant to be. It is to be vigorous and flexible, for these are the days before it ever became fat and short of breath through prosperity or muscle-bound by organization. These men did not make acts of faith, they believed. They did not say their prayers, they prayed. They did not hold conferences uh, concerning medicine or medical devices, they simply healed the sick. Isn't that fantastic? Think about that. Think about the power a church like that had. See, by modern standards, they may have been naive, as some might say, but perhaps because of their simplicity, perhaps because of their readiness simply to believe, to obey, and to give, to suffer, and if necessary, even die. Uh, The Spirit of God found that he could work with them and through them so that they turned the world upside down. Wow. Wouldn't it? uh, just, Just let your imagination run wild a minute. The headlines and the West Palm Beach Post. Palms West Seventh-day Adventist Church turned the world upside down. Wow. You see, I believe that's possible. Do you? And, and what makes that possible is not me. It's the Holy Spirit. It's each of us surrendering totally and completely to the God of heaven. I want you to please take your Bibles and open them up to Acts, the chapter 2. And we're going to begin with verse 1. Acts, chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 1. Now, I, I, I want to read... A fairly long passage. We're going to go from verse 1 to verse 9. So you will bear with me as we read this, right? Okay. At least one person will. I heard a sure. You know. (laughs) Okay, we got two. John's going to be with me too. All right, you ready? Here we go. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. Now I'm going to stop there for just a moment. I don't want you to focus on the tongues. That's not where I want you to focus. What I want you to think about is how many people are here in this room. We're told, if I remember correctly, about 120 people, right? Now, with just 120 people, do you begin to get the picture of what God did? Now, we're not 120. But even with less than 120, are you beginning to get a picture of what God can do? Okay? Let's continue with verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. 
And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now I want you to skip down to verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? You still see the headlines of the Palm Beach Post? Palm's West Seventh-day Adventist Church turned the, church, the world upside down. Whatever could this mean? Wow. Let that soak in for just a moment. Because you see, I believe not necessarily the headlines would be a reality, but I believe turning this county upside down is a reality. What this meant was that Jesus had risen from the grave and ascended to heaven and he had sent the Holy Spirit to be with his disciples. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Then shouldn't we be fervently, anxiously desiring that same Holy Spirit power in our lives? What do you think? You think maybe maybe that would be a wonderful thing? Ah, Luke... 24, 29, uh, 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And in 10 days between Jesus' ascension into heaven and the, the festival of Pentecost, the disciples humbled their hearts. Now pay attention to this. This is important. The disciples humbled their hearts and, and in the true repentance and confessed their unbelief. In other words, think of it in this sense. Lord, you know my heart. You know I am unworthy of any gift that you may give me. But I thank you for the power of your salvation and I thank you that you are willing to give me the power of the Holy Spirit that I may share the good news of salvation with everyone I come in contact with do you think that prayer would make a difference these disciples meditated on the life of Jesus they prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet people and to speak words that would lead sinners to Jesus Christ and to repentance. Now, I'll be honest with you. I can't do that as a preacher. You can't do it. Unless the power of the Holy Spirit is working in and through us to reach them. You follow me? Still with me? Okay. <clears throat> they, it, 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 you see, it's a shame that the term Pentecostal power is, it, to many people, is associated with uh, speaking in tongues. And, and then, but that's really not what it's all about. Pentecostal power is, is about the Holy Spirit in you and me sharing the good news of Jesus to people who have no hope to give them hope. See, the, the story is told of how many, uh, how years ago, a few missionaries uh, in Korea decided to come together to pray every day at noon. Now, I've told you this story before. Uh, some of you may remember it. Others, you haven't heard it before. But those who have heard it before, I want to remind you of it. 
Okay? You, you still with me? Okay. At the end of a month, remember they're praying every day at noon for a month. At the end of a month, one of the members of this little group proposed that since nothing had happened, they should discontinue the prayer meeting and each one pray at home with convenience. The others protested and said that they should spend even more time in prayer each day so the group continued to pray. They met for four months. You with me? How many months did they meet? Four months. And then the blessings of God began to pour it out. Notice what happened. Weeping and confessing of sins here and there broke up church services. A revival broke out. At one place during an evening service, the leading man in the church stood up and confessed that he had stolen $100 while administering a widow's estate. Immediately, conviction of sin swept the congregation and the services didn't end until 2 a.m. in the morning. One of the missionaries made the statement, it paid well to have spent several months in prayer. For when God gives the Holy Spirit, he accompanied more and accomplished more in half a day than all the missionaries together could have accomplished in half a year. Let me share something with you. Every Tuesday night after Bible study, there is a small group we meet together for prayer for this church, for each of you, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to know this is not an exclusive group. Anybody can join that group. If you come to the Wednesday night Bible, excuse me, Tuesday night Bible said, thank you, Mike. I, I, I'd get there eventually. I want you to know that. Uh, <laughs> anyone that comes to the Tuesday night Bible study, you are invited to join us in that prayer session. I believe in prayer. I believe that through prayer, through prayer of this congregation, just as those guys did in Korea, the same thing can happen here. I believe that. But it's not going to happen unless we spend the time in prayer. And I know I could say, as, as some said then, well, let's just pray in our home, own homes at our own convenience but I'm more inclined to go along with the others because I believe there is power when people come together and pray. What about you? So that's why we're doing it. You are invited, every single one of you. You're invited to join us on Tuesday night after the Tuesday night Bible study. I hope you do, but it's strictly up to you. In one church, <clears throat> it was announced, now listen to this one. It was announced that daily prayer meetings would be held at 4.30 in the morning. Why those expressions on your face? I don't understand. The first day, 400 people showed up. And they were there before 4.30. The number grew to 600. All I'm asking, you know what's coming. <laughs> All I'm asking is that we as a congregation show up at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. That's all I'm asking. Can you imagine though? 400 people 
getting up and being there before 4.30 in the morning to pray. Think about it. The most important factor about the experience of Pentecost was not that there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind which filled the whole house. It was not the tongues of fire that rested on each head. It wasn't that the disciples were able to speak other languages and other dialects. The central feature of the experience was that the Spirit of God came upon the disciples in a new and dynamic way. I long for that. They were filled with boldness and and a burning desire to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Our church today needs to discover once again that we have an unchanging God and an unchanging kingdom that he wants to bring us to. We need once again to discover the power of Pentecost. What do you think? We need to become a Pentecostal church. And I'm not talking about changing denominations. That's not what I'm talking about. So please don't leave here and say, Pastor Mosley wants to join the Pentecostal church. (laughs) That's not what I'm saying. But we need to be a Holy Spirit-filled church. What do you think? We need to be a church like the Acts 2 church. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to be operating in the gifts of the Spirit. We need to see people's lives turned around because they found Jesus through the boldness of the witness of the believers in this church. We need to experience the unity of the Spirit that was experienced in the early church. Ah, We need to be living in a genuine love for each other. Not just talking about it, but it comes out in the way that we relate to each other. Ah, And we need, when we fail, and we do, But we need to not be so proud that we don't seek reconciliation. What do you think? We need to have the fire fall on the people of God in this church. And if that's going to happen, our church happen in our church. There are certain conditions that need to be met, which it concerns the perceptions of change, if I can put it that way. Basically, we need a paradigm shift. And here's what I want to talk about. There's three things that we need to see happen. The first one is this. Pentecostal power comes when we realize that the Christian life is not just coming to church on Saturday morning. It's about knowing and having a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about surrendering my life, my body, my mind, and my heart to Jesus and asking him to take up residence in my life. It's about banking everything I have and am on God and loving him with all my heart. The Christian faith, listen to me now, the Christian faith is not a feeling. It's a reality. 
It's a real relationship with a real person, Jesus Christ. Christianity is about the most powerful and wonderful person in the universe who desires to know us intimately. And this experience is not tame. It's wild and powerful. Paul says in Philippians 3, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. What about you? Secondly, Pentecostal power comes when we realize the Christian life is not just about salvation, but about transformation. Okay? Still with me? If our faith only consists of a single event where we repented from our sins and came to Christ, joined the church, and that's it, it's an incomplete faith. What if a baby was born And we all celebrated that new life. But the baby never took in nourishment. Was never nurtured. Never grew. And never developed. What do you think would happen? As wonderful as that birth was, it's true. It would not survive, would it? Doctor calls that type of scenario, scenario failure to survive, or excuse me, failure to thrive. I want you, you remember, some of you will remember, at Tuesday night Bible study a while back, we went through the little book, Last Day Events. Remember that? You remember that, don't you, John? Okay. Lenore, you were there. I wanted to... I want to remind you of of a, a quote that we looked at. A revival, let me put it on the screen. A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits, and practices. In other words... Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with revival of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work and in doing this work, they must blend. Thirdly, Pentecostal power comes when we overcome apathy with zeal. Did you catch that? We do what? We overcome apathy with zeal. We can't just point to the past experience of being born again and say that we are Christians. We have to grow. We have to want to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ and want to be made like him. We can't be apathetic toward the things of God and his kingdom and experience. Pentecostal power. We we can't just talk about it. If I can put it that way, we need to be preparing to experience it. What do you think? A true transformation results in a transformation of the heart that loves God and desires to know him better every day. When we are delivered from the bondage of sin, as God has done through Jesus Christ, 
and ushered into the kingdom of God where there is freedom, we delight in the things of God. Listen to me, this is true. The more we know about God, the more you're going to love him. And the more excited we will be about his kingdom. The more we love him, the more we will want others to know him. The more we experience his presence and power, the more the more we want. Does that make sense to you? This, this is the way God wants us to live. We have been forgiven. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your past was like. We have been forgiven. And the beauty of it, Jesus, that God loves, uh, that God remembers those things no more. Do, do, you re, do you realize this? Now think about this. For the righteous, for those that are in Christ Jesus, there is no judgment of condemnation. Everything you did wrong has been wiped clean. So what are you going to be condemned by? Think about it. Ah. Oh. We have been forgiven. We have in inherited eternal life. We have experienced eternal love. We have discovered life. We have found the pearl of great price. And it is worth more than anything else we have seen or ever possessed. And because of this, we are to be excited. We need to be excited about the wonderful God we serve. We are willing to do whatever it takes to have more and more of him in our life. Aaron Ralston was a 24-year-old who had his right arm pinned under an 800-pound boulder in a climbing accident. He had gone hiking, hiking in the Blue John Canyon Park there in, in the Utah Canyon Lands National Park. He was an experienced climber, for he had already climbed 49 other peaks in Colorado, which were over 14,000 feet. However, while he was pinned under that boulder, he thought about what it would be like to die on the mountain and have his family find his body or perhaps never find his body and never know what his fate was. He was a former engineer for Intel and an avid outdoorsman. Thought about his options. After five days of being pinned and having run out of food and water, he made a decision. He died, tied a tourniquet around his arm, took out his pocket knife, and amputated his arm below the elbow. Then he rigged uh, anchors and repelled to the canyon floor with his good arm. He walked downstream until the Utah public safety helicopter spotted him. What the news didn't say much about was that this five beta kappa credits his faith in God for the ability to do what he had to do. Here's the point. Because Aaron wanted to live, he was willing to cut away everything that was holding him back. You know where I'm going, don't you? 
You see, it's that kind of commitment and zeal that will enable us to experience Pentecostal power. When we are willing to cut away everything that is holding us back and walk out of the canyon of bondage, as it were, then the Holy Spirit can come to us in, a new, in new ways, ways we never dreamed of, and we will know a life that we never thought possible. I believe that. Oh, I want you to believe it too. Hebrews 12, verse 1 this is the New Living Translation. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And then we find that the Apostle Paul wrote this, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul did it. The disciples did it. Christians in the book of Acts did it. So what about us? Are we willing to strip away every weight that slows us down? Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. I know it's a fight. I know it's a battle. And I know it's not easy. But I also know that he that is in us is greater and stronger than he that is outside us. And dear people, you know this because I've said it so often. Jesus is coming back soon. And I realize soon is a relative term but as I look around at what goes on in this world, I, I know it can't be much longer. So let us run with endurance. Let us run the race that God has set before us. Let us encourage others to do the same.